All right. It is uh, good to see everybody this evening and uh, glad to glad to get a new start on a new topic that should be a, a lot of fun. Uh, Minor Prophets happen to be some of my favorite uh, books in Scripture, and so uh, I'm looking forward to doing this study with you. Um, I'm going to be talking as we go a little bit more about um, you know what exactly it is we're going to do with this study and um, what tonight's class is going to be really is more of an introduction uh, to the Minor Prophets. And I hope that some of the stuff I'm going to be presenting to you will be some things you haven't really encountered before. So I am curious as we get started. Um, I, I was reading a book by our own uh, Jack Lewis uh, earlier today about Minor Prophets, kind of some of the introductory material. He was saying how some people like to accuse us of you know, not paying attention enough to the Old Testament. And he said, when it comes to the minor prophets, functionally speaking, uh, for many people, it might not have made that much of a difference if someone had torn them right out of your Bible and thrown them in the garbage. You know, as long as you couldn't tell it had been done to the Bible, you might not know the difference. Uh, so uh, we've, we've sometimes focused on what we would call major prophets. And I think that that distinction is ultimately an unhelpful one, major and minor. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where that came from, but I hope that uh, you'll find some stuff in this study uh, that is really useful to you, and uh, I'm, I'm excited uh, to do this. So uh, let me go ahead and get onto our slide images. Very good. Okay, so here's my title. I was, it's hard to come up with a title for the Minor Prophets, you know, the 12-something, the uh, you know, I don't know. So I thought Turn and Return was about uh, as, as good as I could do. And I do think it in some way encapsulates some of the big ideas in the Minor Prophets, that the prophets are always calling on people to turn from their evil ways and also to return to God. Uh, that becomes really significant as we see some of the different themes explored. So um, while we're getting started, I am just kind of curious if you would comment. I'd like to interact with some of your comments. When you think of the Minor Prophets, I'm just curious like for you, what comes to mind? Uh, we're talking about minor prophets. We're talking about those 12 books beginning with Hosea. So Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, right? So um, starting from Hosea to the end of the Old Testament, I'm just kind of curious. Do you have certain passages you think about? Is there a theme that you kind of associate with them? Are they just unknown to you? It's okay to say that if they are. Uh, that's why we're doing this, to familiarize ourselves a little more. But I'm just kind of curious if you all have some comments on that. Like when you think of the Minor Prophets, what do you think of? Um, next week, we'll start into Hosea and kind of work our way through them. Hosea happens to be, uh, I've said for many years, it was my favorite book of the Bible. Um, Romans might have passed it for me at this point, but... I'm really fond of Hosea. Now, there's some there's some powerful stuff in there. So uh, this is a study I've been looking forward to. Um, let me let me move on and get talking. But I am interested. If you make some comments along the way, I'd like to pause and see what you have to say about what do you think of when you think of the minor prophets. So let's just talk briefly about prophets and what they were. Um, it's pretty clear that some of them get inspired uh, to do their work in different ways. One of the things you don't really get to see much in the Minor Prophets, aside from Hosea, is the prophets kind of having to use events or things in their life as like props uh, to talk about and teach things. Um, it's pretty clear from a couple of passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah that very often what prophets would do, um, at least as their books have been written down, prophets are not primarily writers. Prophets are primarily preachers. And so a lot of the messages in both the larger prophetic books and also in the minor prophets would be small enough where a person could feasibly be sitting in the temple courts or standing in the temple courts to kind of harangue people as they walk by. And you might think about those news tickers, like if you've got a news station on and then there's always that ticker at the bottom that's just kind of going through um, you know, information or updates about things going on. You might say the prophets were kind of like that ticker, perhaps, in how they functioned uh, in a normal setting. So it might not be the case that they're the main preacher, but they're talking to everyone on the way in. And when you have a shorter message, you can kind of put it on repeat so that over time, as more and more people pass by, you've had the chance to use your prop or to talk about what it is you're making a uh, point about. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's one thing to think about when you think about 
prophets in general, probably many of them had shorter messages that have been strung together into some longer books. But a lot of the individual things I would have been preaching are likely fairly small uh, in, in size, just a few minutes at a time. Um, in terms of like prophet, like what is a prophet? There are several different titles used to talk about people who have this function. Uh, sometimes they are called a spokesperson. Uh, and men and women could be prophets, uh, both in Old and New Testament. Men and women are prophets. And uh, this is a person through whom God reveals his will. And very often that is the case where God cares about what's going on and he reaches out to one righteous person uh, and sends them to be his spokesperson and to reveal what it is that he wants to have done or what it is he's going to do if something doesn't change. My personal favorite term for a prophet is the seer, one who sees things. I, I just, I don't know, I just think it's a cool word, but one who sees. Um, they're seeing things that other people aren't seeing. Uh, they're aware of things that other people might not be aware of. They're getting a vision from God where the world has become this bland, repetitive, negative, frustrating place. And it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz when you go to the color scene in the land of Oz and everything that was gray became colorful. It's like that's what happens when you invite God back into the picture. Everything goes from gray into beautiful technicolor uh, splendor. So they're seers. Sometimes a prophet would be referred to as a, as a man of God, uh, someone who is God's person. Sometimes a man of the spirit. Uh, we do talk several times in scripture about the, the spirits of the prophets. Um, the most common designation for prophets would actually be the word we translate prophet, navi in Hebrew, and that would mean a called one. And this is a this is a pretty good term because that is their function. It's not that they've earned the right to be heard on God's behalf, but instead uh, God has called them to his purpose. So most often a prophet is a called person. And in fact, uh, in the Old Testament, 400 times that word navi gets used in a noun form, 110 times it gets used in the Old Testament as a verb form, that same word, you know, used a couple of different ways. So in terms of the common ways of referring to prophets, Navi is definitely the, the winner uh, in terms of usage. So, okay, I've got a few, I've got a few comments coming in here. Let's see what you have to say. Um, yeah, so Randall's mentioning that yeah, minor prophets wrote less than the major prophets. And yeah, that would definitely be the case. Uh, the minor prophets, as we call them, are several smaller books, 12 smaller books, kind of, you know, kind of brought together. I'll talk a little more about that. But uh, yeah, not the case that their message is minor, simply the case that their contents are smaller uh, than the larger prophets uh, often placed before them. Um, the theme to me, Diana says, is simply listen, people to what God has to say through me. Uh, that's definitely true. Uh, they're showing up often at a significant time in history to represent God, to speak on God's behalf. And I think importantly, I, I talked about this some when I was uh, doing the uh, lessons a few weeks ago in Ephesians about the different types of gifts. And I talk about people having sort of a prophetic function among the church, even today, where not necessarily the case that God is giving us visions of the future, perhaps, but that um, God wants us to challenge each other to radical faithfulness. And that is absolutely a function of the prophets. So as they're saying, listen to what God has to say through me, very often it's based on the covenant. You know what God told you you were supposed to do. You know all that God did to put you where you are. Why are you not honoring God rather than avoiding God or giving God leftovers? You know, how, why are you not giving God the importance that he deserves? So thank you, Diana. That's one way to think about it. Yes, Hosea speaks of God's forgiveness. Very important theme. Jonah, one of the more popular minor prophets. And interestingly so, isn't it? I mean, we I preached through Jonah a couple of years ago. And just because we make children's storybooks out of him, where I guess everything has to always smile and be colorful, um, he's he's kind of a kind of a scoundrel in several ways. He's really not interested in seeing Nineveh uh, get too much mercy. Uh, this is a good one, Debbie. Yeah, minor prophet's message: turn from evil and come back to God. So perfect, perfect. And if I could revisit my uh, my title slide, that's definitely a direction I think we ought to go, Debbie. Turn and return. Turn away from evil and turn back to God. Very good.
Very good. So appreciate those comments. Glad to hear from you as we uh, continue along. Uh, I think it might be helpful to talk a little bit about some important dates that are relative to this period of time. It would make a difference, for example, if I were teaching a class about George Washington for you to know whether he was serving in the Revolutionary War or the Civil War. The context makes a difference. And that's also true of the minor prophets uh, when we read about them. So I'm going to just briefly go through some historical events that kind of encapsulate the period where these guys uh, are talking. And um, some pretty significant stuff happens. At the beginning of uh, the, the 8th century, so the 700s BC are called the 8th century, um, you have the united, well, actually, excuse me, it's the, the divided kingdom at this point, but you've got the kingdom nonetheless. So there's Israel in the north, there's Judah in the south, Jerusalem is in the south, and it's considered kind of the more faithful, God-fearing bunch, whereas up in the north, Samaria has made their capital, and there is idolatry present in Samaria. Uh, I believe it's Jeroboam who um, started introducing uh, a, his own form of temple worship um, up in, in the north and trying to get people not to make their pilgrimages south to Jerusalem to worship. And so he was really trying to firm a heart, make a firm division between north and south. And so there's a lot of animosity and mistrust and speaking bad of each other, which certainly is still in play in Jesus's time. But 722, very significant date. This is when the north is conquered. Uh, Assyria takes Samaria, which means that Israel, the northern part of the kingdom, is now taken into exile by the Assyrians, who are very nasty people. And so Israel in the north has gone into exile. In 606 BC, you have the Battle of Carchemish, and this is when it shifts from the Assyrian Empire being in control to a decisive victory where um, Babylon is now becoming the dominant uh, empire in the world. Just a few years after that, in 586 BC, this is the destruction of Jerusalem in the south. So remember, Samaria and Israel in the north. They fall in 722, and everyone in the south said, ha, 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 you bunch of godless heathens, that's what you get. That's what you get for being idolaters and all this. And as it turns out, in the south, they really weren't any better. And so 586 is when Jerusalem is destroyed, and then the south is also thrown into exile. Uh, 539 BC is when the Persian period begins. Uh, just shortly after that, this is when Cyrus permits the reconstruction of the temple and sends people to work on that. That's a pretty involved process with Ezra, Nehemiah, and um, some others over the years. But uh, 520 BC is where Haggai and Zechariah show up, uh, encouraging the efforts, as we'll see. And then 445 BC is roughly the time that Nehemiah uh, rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem. So uh, those are some important dates. And as we're encountering the different messages, most of them, Joel being an exception, most of them we kind of know where to place in that order of events where, you know, there's rebelliousness, they lose the kingdom, first the north, then the south, and then they're in exile, which eventually under the uh, Persians, they're able to go back and do some rebuilding, but never to the, never to the degree um, of what they had before. So they make some progress, do some big things, but it's never like what it was before because they don't have the kingdom anymore. Now, if you have any questions about any of that stuff, feel free to comment, ask me to slow down or repeat something, but hopefully those are semi-clear dates, and I hope you're able to kind of understand the significance of all that, uh, the, the kingdoms and, and what happens as they hang on to them or lose them. So in this context, an important question that everyone's thinking about is, is there really a future for Israel after the 8th century? Now, they wouldn't have called it the 8th century. For them, it was the present. But now that we've lost everything, is there a future for us with God? There is no king. There is no kingdom. And they are not in the land anymore. They've been driven out of their own land. Uh, the holy city is lying in ruins. Its walls have been destroyed. There is no temple. And according to all that stuff in Leviticus, if you're going to worship God properly, it has to involve the temple and sacrifices and a lot of things attached to that. All of a sudden, um, it's a dilemma we relate to. Like the importance for us of being able to assemble together. You know, how do you be the church when you can't be the assembly? I mean, which is what ecclesia, the Greek word for church, actually means. It, it, it's the 
It literally means called out, but it's a term commonly used for assemblies in the ancient world. So when we talk about the church, what we're talking about is the assembly. How do you be a church when you can't all get together very easily? It just kind of undermines everything. So for them, how do you manage to be God's people when you can't really uphold most of what you've been required to do in terms of where you were sacrificing and worshiping and all the different things that were in place. Uh, so it's a really, really disruptive time in Israel's history. And you have to ask that question. Well, now that we lost everything that God gave us in terms of our land, our possession, um, our nationhood, is there any value for us in having a relationship with God? This is where I believe the minor prophets played an important function because they are showing up, especially at some of those important times and dates that I was mentioning, especially when things are in turmoil. It's often when we'll find one of those voices of a minor prophet who is speaking into that circumstance, giving them a relevant word of the Lord. So God hasn't abandoned them, but they got some major questions about how exactly do we be the people of God when we're back to being just a people and we don't have land or a king or territory and we're not self-governing and everything we depended on is now destroyed. So it's a tough context in a lot of ways. So um, in terms of this designation, minor, uh, the first time, my understanding is the first time we find that distinction used to refer to these 12 books is by Augustine of Hippo in his book, City of God, which I think was around 426 AD. But up until 426 AD, no one called these the minor prophets. Most commonly, the 12 minor prophets are referred to as the Book of the Twelve. The Book of the Twelve. And it was the case that... Um, they would all be contained within a single scroll. And in fact, if you compare the length of the 12 minor prophets together as a unit to Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Ezekiel, it's of a comparable length that kind of fits in among those other major prophets, so to speak. So uh, a lot of these guys would have you know, one scroll set aside for their book. The 12 minor prophets were all put together. So... Um, my personal preference at this point would actually be to refer to them as the Book of the Twelve. Uh, I like thinking, and I'll talk more about this, I like thinking about the different ways that they have a cohesive message and they fit together, and I think are actually meant to be read and studied in light of each other. So uh, me personally, I'd like to go old school, early church approach and call them the Book of the Twelve, but I know Minor Prophets is a distinction we're used to, and you know we can thank Augustine for that one, but that one has kind of stuck around. But uh, that's an, an interesting detail that I think um, is lacking for many people as they approach these 12 books, the understanding that if we were dealing entirely with scrolls, there'd be one scroll that had all 12 of them on it. The flow uh, of how these move along... Um, it's kind of chronological, but not entirely. Uh, Joel, for example, in some ways, Joel is like the perfect uh, encapsulation of the message of all the minor prophets. I mean, what Joel, Joel is a, a short little book, but Joel encapsulates so much of what the rest of them do concisely. But we also have no context to know exactly who Joel is talking to. And so uh, it's very difficult to place the dating of Joel. Um, and that's one of our challenges in general with several of the minor prophets. You know, with guys like Isaiah, you can have, have the story of his calling and some of his life experiences. Same thing with, you know, prophets like Samuel uh, or Elijah and Elisha, where we know a little bit more about their life and what they were up to. Uh, these minor prophets, often we have just brief, brief details about who they were. Basically, all we've got is their message. Uh, so a little bit harder to know exactly why they're arranged the way that, we, the way that they are. I would say that there is this ongoing theme of sin followed by punishment followed by restoration. Now, what's important to understand is all three of those themes are present in all of the books of the Minor Prophets. So all 12 of these will have those themes to some degree within them. But I think you could also make the case that loosely... Uh, the minor prophets flow in some semblance of that order. And so again, um, these books don't deal exclusively with these themes, but if you were to look at Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah, 
all of them have some level of confrontation with the problem of sin. Again, it's in all of them, but you can see how uh, sin is a really driving theme they're having to address. Joel's huge on repentance. Hosea's got um, you know that unfaithful wife who's kind of the living um, illustration of the problem of infidelity of God's people. Uh, Amos is really strong on condemning the nations, and then he turns and points the finger at God's own people. Um, Obadiah is all about how Edom's going to be destroyed because of all that they've done when Israel was being uh, conquered. So um, sin is a major theme in some of the first books. Uh, punishment is one thing that we see in uh, Nahum and uh, Habakkuk and Zephaniah. Uh, Nahum is all about Nineveh. Jonah managed to give them a positive message at the end that they weren't destroyed, but um, Nahum, uh, they don't get any such luck. In Nahum's prediction, they are going to be destroyed. Ultimately, they were. Habakkuk, Zephaniah. But then, as you get to Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, these books are occurring a bit later chronologically. We talked earlier about how these are the books being written at the time that Jerusalem's getting restored, the temple's being rebuilt, eventually the walls are able to be rebuilt. They're talking more into that context of God restoring things. And so um, I think if I had to provide some sort of a loose flow to how these books move, it's somewhat chronological, not completely, um, but those themes do flow as like a bigger picture, but also individually, I think, within the books. So that's, uh, I've just not really seen a lot that I'm totally satisfied with in terms of how do you explain the flow of the minor prophets or their order? It's not, not completely clear to me. Uh, some themes, when you consider the prophetic books kind of as a whole, and obviously this is oversimplified, but you could say, for example, Isaiah has a big theme that centers around Zion, God's holy mountain, the mission that goes out from God's mountain. But Zion is like the big driving theme in Isaiah. Jeremiah deals much with lament, how the, the, the nation's going to fall. He sees it coming. He tries to warn the people. They respond to him terribly and they mistreat him and they're awful to him. Uh, then he also got his book Lamentations, which is him lamenting what's actually happened. Uh, Ezekiel centers around the glory of God, uh, getting to see God and, and, and who he is and, and what God's glory should be like as it's honored among us. But when you look at the 12, there are a lot of ways that the 12 hold together through this theme of the day of the Lord. Now, you, you find that theme in other places, but never so prominently as you find it in the Minor Prophets. The Day of the Lord, again and again and again, it shows up. And if you could pick a theme that sort of orients all these books together as a cohesive book of the Twelve, the Day of the Lord would be that driving concern uh, that there have been uh, times of unfaithfulness and God's judgment is coming, and it's kind of up to you whether God's presence uh, is is a thing you enjoy or a thing that is terrifying to you. Because the day of the Lord, there are many points in history we could refer to as the day of the Lord, the, gay, the day that God did something, uh, sometimes militantly, to deal with something in the world. But um, the day of the Lord, as we most often speak of it as Christians, we're kind of looking forward to the return of Christ. But up until that point, there have been many points in history you might would refer to as the day of the Lord, or as some later would refer to, the, the fullness of time. You know, at some points, God just needs to do something. So um, hopefully all that is clear. And again, I'm trying to keep an eye on your comments as we go. So if you have any thoughts, questions, I'm glad to try and uh, speak to those. So this is one of the questions I've been referencing. When we think about these 12 books, should we think about them as a singular book or a collection of books? I think the answer is yes. I think there is great value in looking at them individually as we intend to do, but there is also value, I believe, in looking at them as a collection. Uh, there are some themes that run throughout them. So I mentioned to you, I'm hoping to present some stuff to you tonight that I'm betting you probably haven't ever encountered before. This is going to be that section. So uh, I did a pretty deep dive into the Minor Prophets uh, back several years ago, and this to me is some really fascinating stuff. But part of why you might could argue that you should think about these as a single unit is that it really does appear that whoever, you know, acting with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, whoever assembles these 12 books 
and the order that they're assembled um, really was intentional about how these came together. We would certainly say that, you know, the Spirit of God is at work in this, but if you'll notice, like what I'm doing with this artwork over on the left, it is often the case that you have something at the end of one of the books that is immediately picked up on in the beginning of the next book. So I want to talk about some examples of this because th this to me was just fascinating. I, I would have never thought of this on my own. And most often as I've encountered these books, people just kind of studied them at random. Or maybe you went in order, but you just treated them each as an individual book the way you would Isaiah or Jeremiah. But um, I want you to see the way that these books tie together and how for many it really did function as um, a unit. So for example, the book of Hosea ends with a call to repentance. Joel follows Hosea. Joel is the only book to begin with a call for repentance. So he ends with that theme. Joel picks right back up on it when he starts talking. Uh, Joel ends with words for the nations. And so Joel's going to express, um, that's one of the things in the prophets, God's fussing at his own people, but then sometimes he's fussing at all the nations around his people. Joel ends by talking about the nations. And if you've ever read Amos, there's that pattern in Amos for the three sins of whoever, or even for four, I will not relent. And he's talking, he picks out all the different nations around them, then eventually turns his focus toward Israel, God's own people. But Joel ends with a focus on the nations. Amos picks up after Joel and begins with a focus on the nations. This is one that's especially interesting to me where Joel says near the end of his book, the Lord will roar from Zion. And in verse 2 of Amos chapter 1, the Lord roars from Zion. And so there's some things like that that you look at and say, hmm, you know, there, there's really some connection between what this one was doing and where this next one picks up in terms of like what themes and things they're talking about. Uh, some other examples. Amos ends with a claim that Israel will possess the remnant of Edom. So the very end of Amos, he has a harsh word for Edom. Well, the book of Obadiah is a short book, but it is entirely about Edom. Uh, Edomites are descendants of Esau. So you remember Jacob and Esau. So Israel comes from Jacob. Edom comes from Esau. So you could think of them as distant cousins, right? They know that way, way back they're kind of related. But uh, we'll talk about this when we get to Obadiah. But the Edomites were laughing and mocking and just delighting uh, while the Israelites are being torn apart. And they're living up in the hill country, so to speak. And so uh, God has a word for the Edomites. But this is following the end of Amos where God talks about the Edomites. And then Obadiah immediately picks up on that theme. Um, here's another interesting one. Uh, this unusual phrasing where Zephaniah says at the end of his work, at that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. And then Haggai picks up in chapter one, verse two, the people will say the time has not yet come. And a few verses later, he asked, is it time? So at that time, the time will come. Is it time? So uh, just little interesting tidbits, I think. Uh, and to me, one of the most fascinating ones is the way that you can make bookends around this. So if you're familiar with the story of Hosea at all, uh, God gives him this horrible task in life to marry a woman who's going to be unfaithful to him. And he has to give these horrendous names to his children. And in Hosea's life, his marriage is disrupted. And God uses that to talk about how he has married himself to his people, but his relationship to his people has been totally disrupted. God's own marriage was disrupted. But then you go all the way to Malachi at the end of these 12. And one of the major themes in Malachi is God's distaste for divorce. And what we see in Malachi is God's relationship to Israel being restored. So you start with marriage disrupted, you end with marriage restored. And so uh, infidelity and restoration form the bookends which really do characterize so much of God's interactions with his people. All throughout the Minor Prophets, you've got these ongoing themes where uh, a lot of times Israel and Judah are personified as unfaithful uh, women. And um, you know, some of the stuff and examples they use are pretty harsh uh, when they're using feminine imagery, but especially talking about infidelity, these unfaithful spouses. Uh, and so those to me are some really interesting bookends to try and put on this content. And... Um, 
part part of why I would say there is value in reading these books in light of each other. And in fact, I didn't want to bore you, so I limited myself to those examples. But um, I've got some contents I could share with you where some someone has gone through and been able to identify between pretty much all of the books of the, the Minor Prophets, where that kind of thing occurs at the end of one and the beginning of the next. So I think it invites us to think about how one speaks to the other. So even though we might study them independently of each other, there's value in saying, well, I know what Joel is saying, but how does that relate to what Hosea has already told us? I think there's some value in that. So uh, much of this is being written to a people who are uh, in exile, not much is being said about the priests or the temple. Near the end, we're talking about rebuilding. But I want you to notice that in the Minor Prophets, one of the big themes that needs the discussion is not the priesthood or some of the other technicalities. It's just the issue of obedience, that God has done all these things for the people. The people have responded by disregarding what God has done. They question whether he's there at all. They focus on their own houses, their own affluence. They ignore God's things that need to be getting done. Uh, and it's a, it's a collection of books that I think digs pretty deep. But obedience is a major theme we encounter that the prophets are speaking to. And I think that's consistent with what I was talking about a few weeks ago as I was referencing earlier, that I think a prophetic voice is a voice that calls us back to faithfulness to God, to remember what God taught us to do, to remember the ways that God has been helping us, and to be intentional about thinking about, remembering, memorializing, whatever we need to do to keep the faithfulness of God in front of us, because in response to God's faithfulness, we also need to be that faithful spouse. And I think it's not accidental that the church is now referred to as the bride of Christ. So we're the new Israel. We're now the spouse of God. And the question is, will we do a better job than they did? Uh, will we be more faithful than they were? Uh, will we be less self-centered, uh, less focused on our own uh, preferences and things that we were trying to get out of life? Or how much will we really focus on the things of God? So uh, burning questions, important questions. Um, I would say, I mentioned this earlier, uh, Joel in some ways is the hardest of the books to date because there's just not enough detail about his context to know quite where to attach his writing. But there are many ways that you could say Joel kind of encapsulates the, all the major themes, uh, the call to repentance. And Joel has a lot to say, uh, words of warning about the day of the Lord. And so uh, we'll get to Joel in a couple of weeks, and Joel will be a useful book in trying to get in your head like kind of a lot of the other stuff in the Minor Prophets. I wanted to share this passage with you tonight. Uh, we'll get to Zechariah again uh, later, but um, I've, I saw one scholar making the case, and I, th I think he makes a pretty good case, that if you want to get like a summation of the message of the prophets. Like, what are some of the ideas we're really going to be encountering? Um, Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 8 down to about chapter 8 and verse 3, it encapsulates a lot of these ideas really well. So what I wanted to do is to read through this with you, very much inviting you along the way to share your comments or reflections. But it says in verse 8, And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah, which is a, a typical way we see this happening, that God, there is a new word from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty said. So reminding them of what God has said. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless or the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. So um, super prominent in the, the minor prophets are the notions of uh, justice and righteousness. In fact, they often occur in this pair, uh, mishvot v'zadaka. It, it's uh, the Hebrew terms for justice and righteousness. And you see them together all the time. So what does it mean to be a righteous nation? It means to be a just nation. Uh, how do you know if a nation is just? You also see its righteousness. Um, so... Those concepts show up again and again. Um, God is greatly concerned with justice, especially for the vulnerable. And he kind of lays out some of these people groups. What about the widows who don't have anyone to speak up for them? What about the fatherless who don't have anyone to defend them? 
What about the foreigners whose, whose territory this, this isn't, who are just living among you? Don't abuse them or take advantage of them, but be kind to the foreigners and the immigrants. Uh, don't plot evil against each other. So that's a huge concern we find in the, in the minor prophets. And then he continues, but they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. So that's a good encapsulation of those ideas. God had been telling them what he wanted. He wanted justice. He wanted mercy and compassion from his people the way that he had showed it to them. But instead, they chose not to listen. They ignored him. Uh, they were hard-hearted. And they wouldn't listen to, and again, he's very clear that you know the Spirit is involved in sending this message to the prophets. You know These are God's own words from God's own Spirit that they should have been listening to that they were instead uh, ignoring. He continues, When I called, they did not listen, so when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations where they were strangers. The land they left behind them was so desolate that no one traveled through it. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. And so ultimately, God is not going to hold them as innocent when he has driven all these peoples out so that they could possess this territory and be a holy nation, a light to all the nations uh, that should be flocking to them to hear the word of the Lord. But instead, they were self-centered and they were just as bad as all the nations that had been driven out before them. And so instead, God says, well, when I called, they didn't listen. So then when they called, I wouldn't listen. And I scattered them in this wonderful land, this pleasant place that they should have been able to pass on from generation to generation became totally ravaged and desolate. Uh, how unfortunate. But... Um, Again, these are, these are some common themes we're going to see as we deal with what's going on. And I hope it makes sense. I, I walked you through some historical events early on, some significant dates about what was happening with the fall of the north, the fall of the south. I hope you can see the way that that message fits into that grid, uh, where it's a relevant word for people who were going through all of that. Um, he says, the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. So here's that, you know, we talked about the theme of, um, you know, sin and punishment, then also restoration. Here's where the restoration comes into the message. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. So faithfulness and holiness are going to reign among my people, and God is going to return. But as it was, things had to be dealt with, and God was not willing to let things go on like that forever. All right. Um, all right. Again, I'm ha more than happy to uh, interact with you if you've got any thoughts, comments, uh, questions about any of this stuff as we go. Um, Next week, we're definitely going to get more into looking at the individual books and the messages that they have. Um, again, today, we're just trying to do more of a sweeping overview of exactly like what this collection of books is. So how are these books useful to us? Um, I think they're extremely helpful for questions like, how do I act when it isn't obvious uh, with me what God is doing? So I want to trust that God's there. I want to trust that he's up to something. But they're writing to people where there are these long extended periods of time where presumably there just isn't a new word from the Lord. God had given them the message, you know, if he spoke through the earlier prophets, they knew what they were supposed to do. And it was kind of up to them at that point to walk with God and to carry that out. Um, I find it extremely relevant for Christians to dwell on those same ideas. Like it's really exciting to read the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit was powerfully, conspicuously, you know, shaking buildings and appearing as tongues of flame on people's heads. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of miraculous healings uh, just all over the place happening. Um, it's fascinating to read that, but just being candid, right? It, it's not my typical experience that that stuff just happens all the time anymore. But instead, what we've got is that we've inherited this collection of writings from the eyewitnesses, and it is up to be faithful to God, 
to walk with God. I do trust and absolutely believe that God works with us and lives in us through his Holy Spirit and continues guiding us. But there's a lot of the time where I think we're in kind of the same boat that they are, where, you know, they didn't really have a nation. They were kind of a people within a nation that sometimes was friendly to them like the Persians, sometimes was hostile to them like the Assyrians or Babylonians. Some of the time we Christians uh, enjoy times of peace with the nations where we live. We've had a pretty good run with the United States the last couple centuries. But just the same, there are Christians all over the world experiencing great hostility. So how do we be faithful when it's not obvious exactly what God is or isn't going to do to physically uh, protect us or bless us or uh, rescue us? So uh, those, those times in between, I think the minor prophets speak well to that. Um, what does God value in a society? Uh, what does he oppose? He will have so much to say both for Israel and her neighbors what he actually wants them to be like. And I think um, I'm not one that loves to delve into politics, and I'll try to steer clear of that to some extent. I think scripture absolutely has things to say about what society should be like, who we should value, what our actions and our character should be, what kind of a nation the Lord ought to bless. And um, I don't think it's the case that we should always give any nation a free pass just because we happen to live there. Uh, I think God always calls on us to be that prophetic voice calling for greater faithfulness to God. And we have to pay close attention to God to know what that actually looks like. Um, so uh, what does God value? What does he oppose? Um, also, we see that God's judgment. If you're living in a right relationship with God, the day of the Lord should be a day that you can look forward to. For those who had been faithful to God, even scattered into exile, people like Daniel, who was faithful to God in terrible, sometimes difficult circumstances, the ways that God came through for Daniel, the way that God came through for so many of them. So often, um, the judgment of God doesn't have to be a fearful thing. But if you've been living in opposition to God because of your choices in your circumstances, there are some ways that this militant day of the Lord where God shows up and does something, um, it can be a horrifying thing if you're not prepared for it. Um, let's see. This is an interesting, this is an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> uh, Randall saying there hasn't been a new word from God since about 90 AD, uh, 1930 years ago for us. So if, if, yeah, if that's your, total viewpoint. Yeah, you would have to say it's been quite a while. Um, I would not want to say that I don't think God has been active among us and in guiding us. So while I would say, I don't think there's an inspired word of scripture that I would hold up as the word of the Lord in that sense. I certainly do believe God continues to be living and active in his church through his spirit. And uh, I don't I don't hear you saying otherwise, Randall. I just, uh, I don't want to ever give off the impression that we think that God kind of said, well, here's the instructions that you got to carry out. Now it's up to you. Good luck. Pull, you know, pull and tug yourself by those bootstraps because there's nothing said in scripture about pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps that I know of. So, uh, so yeah, I think that God absolutely helps us. But yeah, we don't have uh, a new word we would consider to be scripture since many, many, many years ago. So I, that's one of the reasons I see relevance in the minor prophets. Um, let's see, we got this question also from Gene and Sharon. Do you think that a uh, majority of the people actually knew about these writings and sayings of the prophets at that time? That is an interesting question, and there are people smarter than me who would definitely know more than I would about answering that. My impression, though, would be it was often the case that prophets were speaking to a specific people. So um, I enjoy, Amos happens to be one of my other favorites. I told you how much I like Hosea, but Amos is like, um, a, a, like a shepherd, like a farmer, you know? He's like a shepherd from the south, who's been sent to preach to Northerners. So I would expect it's the case that some of the time the people in a specific location would know about a message, whereas people in other places might not have had access to it as readily. Uh, at some point in time, certainly these books are you know, brought together and um, you know, esteemed highly. We know less about the process of Old Testament canon than we do the process of, of New Testament canon, but my assumption, Gene, would be that it kind of depends on like who the prophet was talking to and where they were teaching from. And I think over time, the words would get shared. 
Uh, much like we see happen with Paul's writings, where over time, it's clear, we talked about this some last week, it's clear that as churches would get letters from Paul, they would say, you know, this is really helpful stuff. Let's make a copy of our letter from Paul and send it to the church down the road so they can have access uh, to the same stuff. Uh, some of that must have been happening, but I would imagine it was not an instant or immediate process. So uh, we are certainly in a privileged position uh, of all people in all times to be able to look at so much scripture in so many contexts so easily. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't know if that was Gene or oh, that was Gene asking, but yeah, um, that would be my response to that. I think it kind of depends on the writing. Some uh, had easier spread, like Isaiah, for example, is dealing with the king. Whatever Isaiah says, if the king is saying, do what this guy says, that could get spread pretty rapidly. Um, someone who's actively have, having to oppose rulers uh, might be a lot harder to get the word out. Some of that actually relates to why we assume that these prophets' messages were often very short. Like I mentioned how kind of like a news ticker, they might have had just a you know five to 10 minute spot or maybe even a two to three minute spot where they would be there and kind of yelling to the people, professing things to the people. But all of a sudden, it might be the case that if the authorities are not friendly with you, you need to be able to get in there, get your word out and then get out of there before they catch you. So uh, a lot of it depends on the uh, circumstances. All right. So I'd say that's some of the usefulness uh, of, of the minor prophets. This particular class, my intention is generally to look at one prophet per week. Hosea happens to be one of the longer ones. I don't know if I'll get through Hosea in one week or not, but my intention is to try and spend about one week per prophet. So we'll, we'll be doing this for a while, but um, I don't want it to be the case that we try to look at excuse me, every verse of every writing, and I don't want this to feel like it gets really bogged down or uh, slowed down. Um, let's see. Yeah, as I mentioned, some of them may take a little bit longer. Okay, one other thing I wanted to mention before I wrap up tonight. Uh, Kevin Burr is now here, and we're excited to have him, and we wanted to give him a couple of weeks to sort of get his bearings. We've been talking a little bit about um, what, what we wanted him to start doing, because now that he's here, we do want to start offering some more options. And I, I wanted also intentionally, I had some different ideas about what I might do with my Wednesday night class, but I wanted to make sure that what he's doing and what I'm doing, um, we wanted to be different categories, right, to give you guys some more variety. And so I'm doing Minor Profits on Wednesday nights, and I'll continue on with this format uh, where I'm on Facebook Live and I've got my slides and stuff. Uh, Kevin uh, has the ability to do some visuals and things, but what he's going to be doing is actually Sunday afternoons. And the time we've settled on is between 4 and 5 p.m. We're going to start this on September 13th, and this is going to be using the Zoom platform. What that means for us is that if you're participating in the Sunday afternoon class, that gets to actually be a face-to-face -face class. So if you're really missing being able to see and talk to people, um, my class, I, I, I guess you guys are able to comment. I'm a little bit more of a gatekeeper on what, you know, what gets on the screen or doesn't get on the screen. Um, with the Zoom classes, um, the intention is that Kevin is going to be presenting some content to give us all some food for thought. And then, kind of depending on the number of people logged in, the intention is actually for us to have some smaller discussion groups. We can do that within the program. Like, all you have to do is log into Zoom, and he'll be able to shift you around where you need to go. But uh, Kevin will open us up with some introductory teaching, and then we'll have some time to discuss and talk to each other as we go. And uh, he's got some good content. He's worked up on the book of Philippians. Looks like this is going to last probably 10 or 11 weeks, what he's doing. But uh, going to get started Sunday, September 13th. We'll be putting the link out so you all know where to go uh, to log in at 4 p.m. there on that Sunday. And uh, looking forward to getting him started teaching and looking forward to having a second option. So starting on September 13th, you got my option on Wednesday nights, and then you got Kevin's option on Sunday afternoons. You could quite feasibly do both if you'd like to do that. So I uh, hope you'll really consider that. Uh, Kevin is, uh, I mean, he just finished up a degree uh, in, in you know, New Testament studies from like a premier seminary uh, in the world, really. He's, he's got some super high quality people that groomed him. And um, I'm already enjoying just our, our staff meetings, some of the comments he makes when we're doing our devotional readings together. So um 
Y'all are going to be blessed by Kevin. I hope you will start planning on Sunday afternoons from 4 to 5 p.m. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting that going. So I wanted to mention that. And even though, uh, for now, I'm taking a break from the Ask Mark Anything format, your questions are still welcome. And in fact, we got some real good questions tonight. So if you... Um, especially questions related to the minor prophets. Uh, I would say for next week, for example, go ahead and look through the book of Hosea. The good thing about minor prophets is that they're just not that long. You should easily be able to read that book, even in one setting if you wanted to, but certainly within a week's time. But if you wanted to read Hosea and come prepared with any thoughts or questions that you have, or if along the way you want to email me and say, hey, here's something I wish you would talk about, or here's something I don't understand, um, Feel free to do that, and as always, uh, I, I want these classes to feel useful, so if you tell me what's helpful to you, I'll definitely try to allocate time uh, for whatever is most helpful. So uh, looking looking forward to that, uh, getting some good words of admonition for Carol about never wanting to put God on uh, uh, on the back burner, how much he helps us and heals us, keeping us grounded. Yeah, I affirm, affirm all that you're saying there, Carol. So... Um, that's about all that I've got to cover for this evening. I hope that was a semi-decent introduction to the Minor Prophets. And again, I don't know if you've ever thought before about trying to read them all in context of each other, from uh, Hosea all the way through Malachi, but there is some value, I believe, in reading them in light of one another. I think they tie together in some interesting ways. So we'll, we'll try to incorporate some of that as we go. So uh, let's just uh, close out with a word of prayer, and uh, we appreciate uh, everyone uh, being here being here with us. God, we thank you for the ways that you do bless us. We're thankful for the ways that you have guided us through your word, uh, the words of the prophets, uh, the words of the apostles, the teachings that we have, the examples that we have, and even presently, Lord, the way your spirit continues to live within us and that we can learn more about your heart from witnessing your love at work in the Christians around us. Help us, Lord, to be dedicated to your purposes. Help us to prioritize you in every way. And thank you that we've had this time tonight to begin examining this important section of Scripture. Please give us wisdom and insight as we go. Bless everyone who's been affected by this uh, terrible virus, um, everyone who's experienced losses, uh, those who are having different kinds of complications, not even related to the virus. Lord, we just have a number of people who are hurting and this isolation we've experienced only makes it worse. So uh, bless all of us who are able to be assembling right now, especially bless those who just physically cannot uh, be present with us yet. And um, in all things, Lord, uh, guide us and give us your peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great night.